No, I wasn't kidding when I said the Flat Earth Theory would be an imperative part of this video. Just comes with the territory. Let's talk about Custom Robo Battle Revolution. You'd think that a guy who's into Kamen Rider and Godzilla would also be into Mecha as well, but that's where you're wrong. The only thing Mecha I've seen from start to finish is Neon Genesis Evangelion, which I know is one of the premier works in the genre next to Mazinger and Gundam. Book you people who say Eva is a deconstruction of a genre I know little about. Anno's not only a massive weeb for Kamen Rider, but made Gunbuster before NGE. Gunbuster itself being a Mecha. My only other exposures to Mecha besides watching out of context episodes of Wing or G on Toonami slash Adult Swim slash the Sci-Fi Channel was Zoids, a series I barely remember anything about, Superior Defender Gundam Force, see Zoids, and this game. Man, I should probably start watching more Mecha. You know it's a doozy of a history when the first place I feel that I should start at is Super Smash Bros. Melee as it provides context to this whole entire series, at least in the United States. Most know the boring solved game for Stinky Weirdos for, well, the aforementioned Stinky Weirdos and then it introduced Fire Emblem to the West. While that's not entirely true, as let me go on a bit of a tangent, the success of Advanced Wars saw Nintendo start realizing their tactics games had a market in the West, as Advanced Wars was released in September of 01 in America, three months before Melee was, and the reason why Advanced Wars had an extensive tutorial was solely because Nintendo didn't have faith in Westerners when it came to playing complex games, and with both Marth and Roy being liked during the localization period of Melee was ultimately the reason why Blazing Blade was released over here as Fire Emblem, Melee did did introduce Custom Robo to a North American audience. Tucked amongst the many trophies that Melee had to offer were the models of the Ray Mark II, the Bayonet, and the Annie from Custom Robo 2 on the Nintendo 64. Yeah, you heard me right. Custom Robo 2. Not only was there a Custom Robo 1, which was also released on the Nintendo 64, another game in the series would be released in 2002 on the Game Boy Advance. GX. With the set dressing out of the way, let's jump back to the 1990s to see where all this noise got started. You see what I did there? Please laugh. Nice Starting up in 1996, with their base of operations being the third floor of the Shiba Matsuo building was the developer Noise. To give a clue to how small they are, Noise originally started with 10 employees, one of them President Shigeo Sasaki, another Koji Kenjo, bumping the number to 26 as of April 2021. I do not know if that number includes the American branch of the company, as there is little information about the developer, or if there even is an American branch. Listed on the company website, Site, noise was founded for six reasons. Development, planning, production, and sales of computer software, planning, production, and sales of various publications, planning, production, and sales of video software and music software, character products, unique names and features, planning with images of people, animals, etc., acquisition and management of copyrights, adjacency rights, trademark rights, design rights, patent rights, and all business incidental to the preceding items. In short, and to make fun of Google Translate as Noise's website is in Japanese, Noise was created to make games. In a greetings from the president, representative director Shigeo Sasaki wrote that, when I was a boy, video games were so special that I had to go to an arcade to play them. A quarter of a century has passed why long for such an environment to make special things, jumped into this industry and worked hard. Games that used to be special are now released on a daily basis and the market is saturated. It is a very difficult time to continue making games. But in such a difficult time, it may be that you are fortunate to be able to make a game. The one who played the game... Oh, I was surprised and then grinned. Make me scream and get interested. I scream and scream involuntarily. I want to make such a memorable game. I would be very happy if I could continue to make games with the aim of creating works that would be good memories for everyone who played. Once again, I don't know how accurate the English on that was because I'm using Google Translate. I would say that the translation is poorer than the dub for ghost stories. But I can make out that director Shigeo and probably the rest of the staff had a love for games. A love that would see them develop their very first game, 
Custom Robo. Custom Robo's creation was directly tied to the lack of third-party support that the Nintendo 64 had. Currently, Nintendo has embraced the third party, but back then it was dicey. It made sense in the NES era as Nintendo was wary of American developers due to the fact that we crashed our own games market. The video game crash of 83 only happened in America while Europe and Japan were enjoying their home computers because of unrestrained third-party development among other factors and was even less up in the SNES era, but come the 64, Nintendo's decision to use cartridges had turned a lot of third-party developers off. It was easier to work with a disc, and that's not even going into the 64's hardware. To rectify this situation, Nintendo came up with the disc-based 64... D... D... Damn. I can't escape this peripheral. To not cover ground that has already been, the DD saw multiple delays not seeing the light of day until late 1999 and only in Japan where it died. While that idea was preparing for the biggest faceplant in gaming history next to the 83 crash, Virtual Boy and the Stadia, to at least salvage some lost years as the DD began development in the early to mid 90s, Nintendo partnered up with Recruit to form Marigold. The 4060 venture was a means to tap into the third party, with Marigold picking up and providing funding to a select number of game studios. Those that were picked were Umbrella, the developers of Hey You Pikachu, Saru Brunei, co-developer of Cubivore, and Noise. With help from Pokemon producer Sune Kazu Ishihara and landing famed composer Shinji Hoso, FADE EXTRA BITCHES, Noise began development for Custom Robo sometime in the late 90s. A key factor that Noise wanted to get across was that they wanted to capture what it would be like to play with action figures if a person became their action figures. This idea would seep into many aspects of the game from the core aesthetic of the series, customizing miniature robots to do battle with other robots, to the simple controls that the game would have. For a bit of nostalgia, the website for the game is still up, link in the description below. Retailing for 6,800 yen, 65 USD, Custom Robo sold around 36,000 copies and scored a 32 out of 40 on Famitsu. I'm going to assume that was a good amount of sales based on a few factors the size of Noise's operation at the time, their experience, and the fact that a sequel would be released a year later in 2000. Custom Robo V2, or Custom Robo 2, would introduce two campaign modes which would be used again in the fourth game. There's even less information, or I just couldn't find it, for V2, with the only notable blip in my radar being that it sold double the amount of what the first game did. A Game Boy Advance game would follow V2, Custom Robo GX in 2002, which is when the series started being considered for normal. America. It was never released in America due to who knows what, but it was teased in Nintendo Power until the fourth game, Custom Robo Battle Revolution, was in development. Putting faith into the game, at least that's what I'm going to call it, Shigeru Shigi Miyamoto stepped up to be one of the producers of Battle Revolution, with its soundtrack being composed by future JoJo's Phantom Blood PlayStation 2 2006 composer Takayuki Nakamura. There are a few differences between the English release and the Japanese release, as some sprites lack effects or were changed the hero no longer has his sweet shinobi PlayStation 2 length headband, and Steelheart's and Boogie's bar has been sanitized. Custom Robo, as it was called in America, was released on May 10th, 2004 in the United States, while Japan got it on March 4th, 2004. Europe, being the joke that it is, never got this game, as the only Custom Robo game they got was Arena on the DS. With Battle Revolution stuck to the GameCube, I am once again riding that dolphin down to Blood Bath Bay. The story of Battle Revolution is cut into two, a new journey and Grand Battle. Though there are two campaigns, Grand Battle is more an extended epilogue than anything else. As such, my recap on it will be tighter than the Cliff Notes version of the Vagina Monologues. With that said, our tale begins on a black screen. Through text boxes, we learn that a father is wishing his son a happy birthday. This isn't a common occurrence for the occasion, as the dad is always busy at his job, but today is special seeing as he's gifting away his watch. Leaving his son with words to never take it off, the father returns to work. Never to be seen ever. 
again. A flash forward confirms this as our main character, living by himself, receives his father's will, telling him to become a Robo Commander. Being seen off by his landlady Lucy, who will see minimal screen time in this recap but is by far one of the best characters in the game due to her comic relief, our hero for the story ventures over to Steel Hearts, a local bounty hunter outfit, to see if he can land a job. Conducting the interview is Ernest, though a member of Steel Hearts, the wisecracking horn dog Harry, does sit in to watch our guy get rejected. Not because of any lack of training on his part, but because he doesn't have a robo, which run for a surprising amount for a society that relies on them. As luck would have it, though, Steel Hearts is hired for a job in the middle of the interview, Ernest sending Harry to complete it and having our yet to be named protagonist tag along to see why he wouldn't be a fit for bounty hunting. Apparently, the local research facility is under attack by some burglars, them trying to steal a prototype robo model designated Ray 01. The person who placed the call was lab director Linda, who also called the police squad to handle the robbers. As Harry mucks into the melee, No Name is giving a crash course on robos before he attempts to support Harry, ending up making the Casanova lose his fight and knock Ray 01's robo cube near the protagonist. Picking it up, Blue Jacket accidentally registers Ray 01 as his. Now owning a robo, the lead of the story finishes what both Harry and the police squad started as he single handedly beats down each of the burglars. With the robbery thwarted, Harry congratulates the man with no name before being lectured by his sister, the captain of the police squad, Mira, for his rashness. However, his spirits get brought right back up when Linda checks on him, telling Harry that the newbie can keep the Rayo one because he does have prowess with the robo. Getting an explanation from Harry over the main character's situation, Linda assures him that the lab can get data from Rayo one anytime it fights and even uses her standing to get our hero a job at Steel Hearts. Speaking of, Linda and Harry finally ask for a name. It's Hero. Well, it could be any name that's eight characters, but for the sake of comedic effect, his name is Hero. Done with introductions, Harry tries to score with Linda, though the older woman shoots him down for the time being. I mean, mature women are something else. At least that's what Harry says. Finished for the day, Hero and Harry head to Steel Hearts to check in with Ernest before heading home. Hero's first day of work sees him properly introduced to Steel Hearts, though one member of the team, Marcia, is nowhere to be seen as she is already on duty before being sent to the gym with Harry to train. At the end of the session, both Harry and Hero called for a gig at Hub Park. Dealing with a relationship dispute, the duo of Harry and Hero overcome Anthony and Thomas, with the two stood-up men running away after their loss. They were going to Pearl Harbor Hero and Harry, but Marcia warned the two Steelhearts of the attack. A startling revelation is made when Marcia asks Hero for his license rank. He doesn't have one. Playing bounty hunter without a license is illegal and could get Ernest into hot water, so the chief pays for Hero's Class D test that he will take tomorrow. Passing it without Harry's help as he was too busy getting a number from the receptionist at the testing hall, Hero informs Ernest of his success before being escorted by Harry so the two can grow closer. I dot E so Hero can tell Harry his backstory. Inadvertently, this sets up the next day's job as Harry dropped Trish the receptionist's phone number in front of Harry's neighbor's apartment, causing the husband and wife, Walt and Carmen, to fight, making their kids cry. Brah. Subduing the two by turning on their robo's safety switch, Hero and Harry are joined by Marcia, who finds the source of the commotion, Trisha's phone number, as well as calms down the children. Seeing as he's been the recipient of some backstory, Harry decides now to dole some out. The reason why Marcia is so distant is because she lost her parents, having to rely on her brother before he too disappeared. Marcia herself also has a strange power, though Harry doesn't tell Hero what it is. Harry further explains that Marcia is driven to get her Class A license because only those that have one are able to joined the police squad, which her brother was a part of before he randomly quit, leading up to his disappearance. The day is not over, though, as Ernest calls Marcia to direct the trio over to Boogie's bar... cafe to capture Marv, a long-running custom robo character, but Harry wonders why Ernest knows where Marv is. He's at the bar, but was legless uh, up to his eyeballs in caffeine and didn't recognize Marv until it was too late. Not like it matters anyway, as rival op Dark Blue, headed by known upstanding citizen and evil ends up catching the outlaw. Boogie himself requested Dark Blue on the account that Ernest was crafting and reciting poetry sloshed. Oh yeah, Hero applied a dark blue as well, but that went nowhere. Teasing the Steel Hearts gang, not unlike a flamboyant Harlequin, Evil and his cronies leave Boogie's bar, our trio doing the same to report back to Ernest. Caught with his balls exposed, Ernest gives the three the rest of the day off. Good thing, too, as the next day, Hero is woken up by a call from Harry. Something has gone down at Diamond's Chinese restaurant, a death more specifically, bringing Officer Mira and her partner Roy to investigate the scene as well. Through some 
some convincing, Marcia is talked into using her half-dive ability on the dead person's robo to see his final moments. The man was fighting an autonomous robo, an impossibility as ARs are meant for manual labor, not combat, with Marcia joining Mira and Roy so that a composite of it can be sketched. As she is doing that, Ernest, Hero, and Harry head back to the office. There, while waiting for Marcia to return, Harry explains to Hero how half-diving affects Marcia. Her emotions weigh on her a hundred times more compared to a regular person. She's distant, not unlike a hedgehog, so that she doesn't get hurt. Showing his good nature, Ernest warns the duo to not treat her differently, otherwise he'll whoop the two. Breaking up the waiting period is a call from Boogie. Having a job to do, Hero and Harry venture over to Boogie's to break a gambler's streak that is putting the bar out of business. First, though, the two have to get through evil and one of his lackeys. Doing that, Hero and Harry sign up for the illegal tournament, with Hero facing off against the cause of Boogie's problem. Shiner. Being soundly beaten by Hero, Harry takes notice of the large Z on Shiner's jacket, flaunting his affiliation to the Z Syndicate, but before the Elvis lookalike can be hauled to jail, he manages to escape with the help of some flickering lights. Since the tournament is over, all the gamblers leave, though special mention goes to the masked Seto Kaiba looking motherfucker as he bumps into Marcia on his way out and her way in. Marcia acts like she just saw her brother, but there's no way that the only other person in the story with blue hair is her brother. Finish with this job, Hero heads home for the night. Tomorrow sees Steel Hearts drafted into a tournament at the gym, which could and does earn the company some good publicity. It, or I'd like to at least think it did, earns them a job from the research lab guard duty. Though Marcia doesn't want to do it, it's not like she can say no. Joining the Steelhearts for this task is Evil from Dark Blue, taking over for his men who have been on duty since yesterday. You know, totally not helping the shady figures stalk the lab. Especially since this morning the labs were in disarray. Splitting up, Harry and Hero gather information about the break-ins while Marcia converses with Linda. Though the day is uneventful, at night, Z Syndicate commanders, led by a woman named Eliza, ransack the lab, but they are beaten back by the combined effort of Hero, Harry, and Marcia. One of the goons even dropped their robo, allowing Marcia to half-dive into it, revealing that there is a power struggle within the Syndicate as its leader has died. Cross-referencing with Linda, the four decide to call the police. Hired and with a job well done, Hero heads home. The next day, Hero is awoken by a frantic Ernest, telling him to go to Boogie's. The robo that killed the man at Diamonds is in the gambling den. Sending Hero at it, as he is the only one out of the three that can't create a Holiseum, Harry and Marcia are shocked to see him beat it. What the robo named Rauhu generated was a completely natural arena with real grass and trees, informing us that anything natural in this world is only a facsimile. Raining on the victory parade, however, is the appearance of the blue-haired masked man and the oni-looking Oboro. Rauhu appearing here wasn't up to chance. Shiner was concentrating some deadly sins in the venue so that Rauhu could feast. Wanting the robo, Oboro and the masked man, who are a part of Z, try to take it, but are stopped by Hero and Harry despite Marcia's please, begging the two not to fight the Syndicate members. Everyone comes up short, though, as Rauhu itself leaves the building. At least Hiro has an inkling on who the masked man is, seeing as he has the same arena as Marcia. Adding to the strangeness of the day, Mira and Linda arrive at the den, with the director thoroughly freaked out about the existence of Rauhu. Just plain tired from the stress of the day, the Steelhearts gang heads home. Another day, another tournament for the trio, this one held at Police HQ, though all that really happens for this day is that Hero and Harry wake Marcia out of her funk from the previous one. I mean, they also win and celebrate at Mira and Harry's house, but only because we need a reintroduction for Hero's backstory and watch. The following day, the Steelheart 3 have a repeat of the police tournament. While Harry and Marcia end up having to go through only four opponents, two no-names Roy and Mira, Hero ends up facing both Linda and the Chief of Police as well. See, the previous day's tournament and the battles today were a test of sorts. Being escorted to an exam room, Hero, Harry, and Marcia end up having to take a license test. One for Class S. Though the fight for it is difficult, as the robo used in the exam is Rauhu, all three pass, though Harry's robo is turned into scrap. The chief, trusting the newly made S-Class commanders, explains Rauhu in slight detail. This organism almost destroyed all of humanity. 
humanity. Its Holoceum is a recreation of the world it destroyed. Unaware of this knowledge is the general public, and before the chief can continue his diatribe, Roy, being sensible for the first time in the story, asks if the three can take a break, as not only did they have to fight a few S-Class commanders, they had to fight Rauhu as well. Honoring this request, the chief lets the outfit go for the day. A repeat of Rauhu's first appearance happens the next day, with it being defeated by evil, not out of the goodness of his heart, but because of his namesake. That, and having a rager for Eliza, who doesn't make her appearance known as this woman has her model flipped. To save an obvious reveal, this is Isabella, another rat in the race for the leadership over Z. Harry begins to jump into a fight with Isabella, but his robo is still at police HQ, and with Marcia wrongfully believing that she lost to this woman earlier, it's up to Hero to easily beat Isabella. But this fight didn't count, as she still had her safety switch turned on, though before the fight can be restarted, Oboro and the now-revealed Sergei step into the cluster. Knowing that she can't take two men at once, Isabella leaves Daimon, letting Oboro and Sergei at Hero and Marcia. Even even though Marcia does defeat her brother, she doesn't get an explanation from him, as he and Oboro use the patented smoke bomb technique to scamper out of Daimon with Rauhu in tow. Absconding from the restaurant back to police HQ, the Steelhearts hear the rest of the story from the Chief, but not before Hero is asked about the state of the world. First being asked if the world is round or flat, Hero answers round, earning a scolding from Harry and Marcia as the world is undoubtedly flat. The follow-up question asks if the world has an end, to which Hero says that it doesn't, once again being berated by Harry and Marcia. School in this world teaches that the world is flat, as there is a giant wall surrounding the entirety of it. Technically true, but that's because humans created dome-like structures to live in after the destruction of the outside world. The world isn't flat, but the outside is a place incapable of sustaining life in its destroyed state. Humanity at large doesn't know about this, as what you don't know can't hurt you? Good thing there aren't any world-ending robots gallivanting around, otherwise people might be scared in their gilded cage. The government itself is content with keeping this masquerade going, undeterred by how antithetical it is to humanity's need to face adversity and evolve. The original Z Syndicate probably thought that too and thus found a way outside. With Roy investigating the location of Z's hideout, the head of police gives the crew a choice. Make an expedition out to the real world to stop Z and Rauhu or continue living in fear. Give Giving them the rest of the day to think about it, the group takes the chief up on his offer. Beginning what can only be the longest day of their lives, Hero, Harry, and Marcia, alongside Mira and Roy, infiltrate Z's base. Through a series of fights and separations, only Hero and Marcia reach the inner sanctum where Sergei and Oboro are waiting. Also in the room in a large rejuvenation tank is Rauhu. Entertaining his uninvited guests, Oboro reveals his master plan of making Rauhu diveable so that he can take over the world. A plan so stupid that Oboro Boro gained tunnel vision from it, as he never foresaw Sergei being a double agent still loyal under Z's original boss, nor Rauhu's own free will rejecting Oboro's dive. With Rauhu escaping to another part of the outside world and Oboro defeated, Sergei decides now would be the best time to drop a massive mound of mind-numbing material that I will break down. The original leader of Z was Hero's father. He created the organization to stop Rauhu as the entire world forgot about its existence and the fact that humanity originally lived in association with nature for the use of memory erasure. Everyone was given false memories when the Dome City was created. During his time in the police squad, Sergei learned about the outside world and even met Hero's father, who asked him if he had something to protect. Saying yes, Sergei was instructed to find something off in the Dome City, which was the fact that Marcia was experimented on due to her ability to half-dive. If the world was such a good place, why was Marcia going through hell? Finding this inconsistency, Sergei joined Z. From there, Hero's father told Sergei about how people used to live in Rauhu. Rauhu is, in all terms, the ultimate life form, adapting to its surroundings by absorbing information from other organisms before killing them. Yet, it was tricked into abandoning its invisible form for that of a custom robo. It saw its first defeat when that happened, but instead of dying, it went into hibernation. Again, no one besides S-Class commanders know anything about Rauhu, and it's only a tiny amount of the whole truth. Sergei voicing his distrust of the government like any sane person, especially since this one is a-okay with history 
revisionism. The device that allowed the government to wipe everyone's mind is the key to beating Rauhu, as it can't evolve with no memory. That device, by the way, is Hero's Watch. Mercia's half-diving is a side effect of the memory erasure, and Sergei left the police squad to both join Z and push Marcia into thinking for herself, this whole plot in miniature when you look at it. Restoring the watch's ability to erase memories, Sergei leads the group to an amusement park to put a stop to the remaining Z syndicate and put down Rauhu. Though they face insurmountable odds as the group is not only split up but beset from all sides, the trio of Hero, Marcia, and Harry face off with the final form of Rauhu and win. Reconvening at the inner sanctum of Z's headquarters, the group hears the last message ever recorded by Hero's father. He warns of the danger about forgetting the past, that humanity must face adversity to overcome destruction and evolve in every sense of the word. The government, despite its best intentions, used its power for evil as it had no right to kill the past. If Hero decides to use the device again, it will prove that humanity should have been decimated by Rahu, as a species that can evolve has no right to live. The group ponders over these words, with all of them choosing to embrace the truth. This leads to the creation of World Remembrance Day, a giant tournament for everyone to show off their robo skills as everyone has been lowered to Class D. Defeating everyone, Hero finds out that the grand battle was a ploy to make him stronger as something something people are exploring the outside world now. Being sent off by Marcia and Harry, Hero's story ends. The story is a tale of two halves, and I'm not talking about the campaigns here. While the first part of a new journey mostly tries to lull the player into the world that is custom robo battle revolution by explaining the ins and outs of what the little mechs do, the second half, which in all honesty is the more interesting part of the story, goes down a rabbit hole of gilded cages, the destruction of humanity, what it truly means to be free, and government conspiracy. Battle Revolution, while not tackling the subject as hard, does go down the same route that Watchmen does in its finale. Is it better to live in an delusional peace born from a lie or face the truth? That's something I applaud Custom Robo for doing, even if it doesn't go the full length that Watchmen or other stories like it do. This story could have been as simple as a Pokemon game, but just like Colosseum, it strove for something a bit more. In saying this, I don't care for the more, shall I say, esoteric parts of the story. Rauhu being this ever-evolving creature hell-bent on the destruction of everything is all the motivation it needed. There didn't need to be the angle that it also feeds on negative emotions to power itself. That explains why it attacked the gambling ring, but why diamonds? Was Don so stressed over his restaurant being closed down that residual resentment started building up there, leading to the third physical encounter with Raihu? What about the first time, then? It would be like if in John Carpenter's The Thing we saw on Wilford Brimley's computer simulation that not only would the thing consume everything on Earth, but it would also get its jollies by doing it. I prefer Rauhu being this unnatural force in the world that just wants to destroy it, not this generic Sin Eater monster. I also feel that it just isn't explained well enough. We know Rauhu fights other living creatures to absorb data from them. Does it then need negative energy to form its pupa to evolve? When it attacks other creatures, does it also generate negative emotions so it can feed and learn? So was it attacking Boogie's bar solely to build its chrysalis as there was nothing to learn from there, and if it was, why did it appear in Daimon's restaurant the first time? The biggest issue facing the story, however, is its pacing. Some of the longest days in the game are the tournaments, with two of them being bunched right up next to each other. Well, at least the gambling tournament serves a purpose as it's to jumpstart the main plot since it introduces both the Z Syndicate and Sergei. The gym tournament screams padding as the only callbacks to it are in NPC dialogue. That's not all, however, as the Funhouse gets this too, though I would argue it's worse there because the game flat out makes up a nonsensical reason for the player to have more robo fights. The final group, for no reason, separates themselves from Hero. Why? Then there's the big exposition dump. You know it's bad when the game breaks it up with two saves, essentially telling the player to take a break. I digress though because the story itself isn't the main focus, as much like Gacha Force, the gameplay takes center stage. That said, the localization, besides some weird changes instead of Ernest getting drunk, he gets buzzed on caffeine, though that is quite amusing, is pretty lighthearted and funny. There's too many moments for me to describe, as from the word go, the story revels in its comedic timings. If I had to say what was the best moment of this, it would be the Flat Earth revelation, though I will talk about that later in the good section. The characters themselves aren't bad, though some are stock, especially the main character who is a player insert. Though to work around this, there are a number of scenes where the player can pick the main character's dialogue, leading to the Yu Narakami third option being a 
staple for this game. The main character can come across as a laughable weirdo, from dooming the world to destruction by not joining the group on the trek to find Rauhu to needing Marcia to tell him to use the memory erasure device. Enjoyably strange is how I describe a lot of the side characters and NPCs as well. This is a game where the player is rewarded by talking to everyone, not because they give you parts or information, but by learning about the little background events that go on within the plot. Whether mainline or NPC, the character interactions in the story are quite good. You don't forget Evil's reveal of being a villain solely because he's a simp or being told by a robot that you have below average intelligence. The world building is kinda neat on its own, though the amount of information that is dropped on the player in tutorial-like sections is a bit much. I like how robos aren't remote-controlled robots, they're an extension of their user's will as diving into a robo means becoming one with it. Taking damage in a robo fight means potential injury due to that connection, and it reminds me a bit of Neon Genesis in that regards. There's also an explanation for why everyone uses robos. Rauhu merging its essence into an older model robo, as Battle Revolution is canonically the last game in the timeline, meant that it could be physically damaged, thus meaning if everyone had robo training, anyone could be able to fight Rauhu. That's what ends up happening in Grand battle. The story also has some clever foreshadowing, particularly when Steel Hearts has to guard the lab. Linda tells the group that the reason why the cops weren't called when people started breaking into the lab was because they were too busy distracting the public. That takes a double meaning once the truth about Rauhu and the outside world gets revealed. Likewise, there's that parallel of Rauhu and humanity as a whole. Rauhu itself is an ever-evolving creature, taking the best traits from entities it interacts with before destroying them wholly while humanity has devolved into living in domes self-assured in the gilded cage. It is a bit of a skin-deep observation, as that is about as far as it goes, but you could view it as the theory of evolution in layman terms. Stagnant organisms don't last, with only those striving to overcome or adapt to their surroundings coming out on top. It's completely ironic that Rauhu got dealt the same fate that humanity did, forced into stagnation. But while humanity can change and adapt to their surroundings with no background or knowledge, Rauhu is completely reliant on its own makeup. You want to talk about a mixed bag, here it is. That's because the visuals and the audio are fighting with each other. No better is this scene than in the opening cinematic. If you wait for a period of time on the title, it will play the introductory cinematic, which is well animated and good looking CGI. Then you hear the doom door opening sound and everything goes out the window. This isn't a one-time occurrence in the movie either. Anytime Ray-01 jumps, it plays that exact sound. The only time I went to hear that door opening noise is in Doom, anywhere else and it's completely distracting. In the game proper, while you could argue that the character design is a bit generic, I do like it and I don't know if it's because I was raised in that era of generic anime design. I don't know if that is a proper description or not, or if it reminds me of other anime-adjacent media that I've engaged with. I brought up Pokemon Coliseum earlier in regards to the story, but that comparison runs deeper than that as Battle Revolution's character design and world layout remind me of that game. This isn't a bad thing, mind you. Coliseum and XD are two of my favorite Pokemon games. This doesn't apply to all the characters, as I truly think Evil and Harry have somewhat good designs. I just wonder why Harry has an association with Camo. Need to tell him and Taiga that fad died in the 90s. Or Camo onesies worse than camo pants? While you are deducing that, what does hold its weight are the robo designs. It makes sense as they are the focus of the game, but man, some of the designs are fantastic. Some that come to mind are of course Ray-01, a futuristic update on the standard Ray design, the Strike Vanisher Hallbird, which hits a happy medium of police and tokusatsu aesthetics, the Lightning Sky Defender has shades of Rob to me, and practically all the illegal robos. Rauhu gets special mention as I like that 
that it looks like a mess of armor components, like its evolution twists and contorts its body to a state that shouldn't be possible. Helping to sell the robos are the animations, which are good to all right, better than the human characters' animations. I swear, not all the animations are bad, but the ones that are can be seen from a mile away. Granted, that isn't the worst part of the presentation, it's the sound. The music itself is fine, good even in some parts as I do like some arena or story specific tracks, but the sound effects are what get me. Anytime any character text boxes, a sound clip representative of how they would sound plays alongside the text. This isn't like Banjo and Kazooie or Star Fox where it's a cute garble, it's a chunky sound clip. What makes matters worse is that the default text speed is naturally slow, but turning it up, thankfully that is an option, causes the character's voices to fire at the player like it's being shot from the worm gun. The player can hit the A button to show all the content of a text box, cutting off the voice, but then they run the risk of accidentally skipping over dialogue. In battle, it's not much better, as certain weapons can crunch the audio. The soundscape in combat is at least varied, though the audio levelation and quality can dip depending on what is going on. Custom Robo Battle Revolution is a hybrid RPG with a focus on arena-styled combat and parts collection. There are a few game modes to Custom Robo, with the two main ones being a new journey and grand battle, but there's also arcade mode where the player battles against a number of computer-controlled opponents as well as multiplayer. With the only way to get new parts is to play both a new journey and grand battle, I will focus on those modes. Only open to the player when first beginning the game is a new journey, the basic story mode of Custom Robo. In it, the player takes control of a nameless main character as they get into robo-battles and story sequences. As such, the main gameplay of Battle Revolution can be split into two sections, the overworld and robo-battles. The overworld sections are where the story is presented. I'm calling this section the overworld despite there being an overworld split up into different buildings because there isn't a better word to distance this part of the gameplay from the actual gameplay. All dialogue is done through text boxes and the player doesn't have a lot of control in these sections. Most of the time the player is forced to go from one location to another to progress the plot, however sometimes the player does have to make a dialogue choice. While most don't do anything besides providing a bit of banter or in the case of the tutorials repeating them, there are two choices in the game that do matter as one leads to a non-standard game over while the other skips over a few fights. The standard day in Custom Robo, as each section of the story is separated into days, sees the player interact with the cast of characters, push the plot along, get into some Robo fights, and head home. While I did say that the player is railroaded most of the time into progressing the plot, sometimes the player is free to roam around, usually when the player is asked at the end of the day if they're going home or not. Choosing to head home will immediately send the player to the next day, but selecting the wander option allows the player to interact with NPCs in any of the areas open to the player. This doesn't have a meaningful impact anywhere in the game, but the player does get to witness side stories that the NPCs are going through, like the police groupie attempting to join the police squad or the lovey-dovey couple in the park. The core of the gameplay is the robo-battles. During a story section, or one of the many tournaments that happen within the story, the player will have to fight you using their custom robo. The diminutive robots are called that because they are fully customizable, each robo having five parts that can be changed out. The body, the gun, the bomb, the pods, and the legs. Perhaps the most important part, at least I think it is, is the body as it generally determines how the player will engage during a fight. Custom robo bodies are split into eight archetypes. Shining fighters, aerial beauties, metal grapplers, little raiders which act like the little sprinter series from previous games, strike vanishers, trick flyers, lightning skyers, and funky big heads. This isn't counting the illegal robos, which are typically one of the aforementioned typings listed earlier, or the hidden burning beast robo. Each style of robo has its own strengths and weaknesses, such as the shining fighters being balanced but don't do anything special, or the metal grapplers being able to take a lot
lot of punishment but have poor maneuverability. And there are three subdivisions for each type being normal, armor, and speed. Every robo, alongside every part, has a listing of stats that determine how it functions. A robo might have better dashing but gets knocked down easier. Each robo is also capable of a melee attack that acts as an instant knockdown and usually provides a bit of invulnerability but has a long wind down. The main weapon of a robo is its gun. Guns come in a wide range from standard Gatling guns and shotguns to ones that launch bubbles or dragons. Guns can sometimes operate differently depending on if they are fired on the ground or in the air. The trap gun, for example, fires invisible projectiles that stay for a bit before becoming visible and homing in on an opponent while on the ground, while in the air it fires a short burst of visible rounds. Finding the right gun is all about how a person wants their playstyle to be. I favor the shotgun, which means the robos I use are generally good at pursuing, while the bombs and pods I use cut off the map. I'll cover bombs and pods together as both have the same purpose, either setting up a combo or locking down the map. Bombs can also act differently when fired on the ground or in the air. Whenever a robo is hit, whether by a gun, bomb, or pod, it is launched into a set direction. Typically, bomb and pod descriptions list out what the direction is, thus using a gun that capitalizes on a hit from a bomb or pod is one of the ways to play Battle Revolution. Just like with guns, bombs and pods come in a variety, so much so that it's a bit hard to describe how each one of them works. While in 2v2s or handicap matches, aligned players can't damage each other with their main gun, but can cause friendly fire with their bombs or pods. The last part of a robo is the legs. Leg parts augment either a robo's dash, jump, landing, or run speed. They are the most boring part as whatever leg fixes a robo's issue is generally the one to pick. When the player gets into a battle, they are first taken to the main battle screen where the player can customize their robo, check out their partner's or opponent's robos, overview the arena, or review game tips. Before a battle starts or when the player customizes their robo from the pause screen, the player can test out their robo combination from the customized screen by hitting the R trigger. When a fight begins, the player's and opponent's robo cubes are shot out from the robo cannon. Before that happens, it can be moved so the player can determine their starting position. That's because each cube starts with a random countdown from 1 to 6. Starting with a higher number, land behind cover. Starting with a lower one, land near your opponent. Once the cubes have been fired, the player can mash the face buttons to speed up the countdown. After it hits zero, the robo is free to maneuver around with the control stick. The A button jumps or dashes if the robo is in the air, the B button fires the main gun, L releases pods, R fires the bomb, X does the melee attack, and Y switches targets if it's a free-for-all, 2v2, or handicap match. A key aspect of fighting in Battle Revolution is that when a robo lands after jumping or dashing or fires the main gun, there is ending lag. Preventing the enemy from taking advantage of that is the conundrum connected to the gameplay as there are multiple ways to get around it. While on the ground, the player can perform a slide shot if they move while firing their main gun, allowing them to hide and cover while still attacking their opponent. Likewise, bombs and pods can cover for the player as if the entire arena is a minefield, no one will even attempt to retaliate. Of course, the player doesn't have to worry about being attacked if they knock down their adversary. Robos each start off with 1,000 life points, but they also come with a stagger meter. Whenever a robo is hit, the stagger meter might also go down. Once it's depleted, the robo is overloaded, knocking it to the ground and making it defenseless for a few seconds. Damage dealt to a downed robo is slightly reduced, but free damage is free damage. Just like when the robo cube is counting down, mashing the face buttons makes the robo get up quicker. Once it gets back up, the robo is invincible for a brief period. Take special notice that when a robo is knocked down, any projectiles fired from the main gun disappear. Bombs and pods still linger, however. Once a robo loses all its life, if an entire team is wiped out or there is one robo left standing, the fight is over. Arenas in Battle Revolution run the gamut, from standard courts filled with walls to a child's playroom to a slab of land surrounded by lava. If there are hazards in an arena, it will always be the lava pit. If any robo touches one, it is immediately launched into the sky in the overloaded state. Knockdown robos can also be launched into lava pools, but they just take damage. Losing a fight in a new journey shows the aftermath of the player character being made fun of or being knocked out because of the fight, though time rewinds as the player gets placed back to before the fight started to try again. Fights in either story mode run on SMT logic, by the way. Winning fights in the main story mode unlocks new parts for the player to use. However, they aren't given to the player. Anytime there is a new part to collect, you must go to the parts generator to pick them up. While battles in a new journey are standard 1v1s or 2v2s, battles in Grand Battle, which is unlocked after finishing Journey, take the tournament format. What that 
means is that each tournament has specific rule sets that it follows, such as not being able to reuse parts. Fights in tournaments are scored in grand battle as the better a player does, i.e. killing fast without taking damage, the more likely they will receive a better trophy at the end of a tournament. Completing a tourney unlocks the next one while doing well unlocks new parts, so grand battle can be a tad bit tedious. Using illegal parts does damper the player's score in these tournaments, so keep that in mind. Unlocking parts unlocks them for all game modes, so it is possible for the player to fight Rauhu in a new journey with Rauhu. Custom Robo has one of my favorite scenes in a video game, as the Flat Earth revelation will always be funny to me, no matter how many times I see it. What makes the scene is that the players never told the state of the world within Battle Revolution. The only basis that you or I have about Custom Robo's world is that it's kinda like ours, just more technologically advanced. So of course the world would be round. And that's the trap the game wants you to fall into. It's a splash of water to the face when you find out, no, this world is actually flat. Helping to add to the hilarity is that Harry calls out Hero for being an idiot as the world being flat is taught from elementary school. This moment is not only the comedic highlight of the game next to refusing to fight Rauhu or joining Harry in the bathroom, but it's also the main plot in miniature. The story is about uncovering the truth and each character gets shocked to find out what it is. The flat earth revelation is one to us as we are going off the assumption that this world is just like ours. Then to emphasize this, we are shown that the world isn't flat, everyone is just in domes due to Rauhu. A double shock to the system. Speaking of Rauhu, who, refusing to fight it, whether by deciding not to go to the outside world or using the memory erasure device, is another one of the game's best comedic moments. For the former, it's the fact that you have to shoot down Harry a good number of times before he gives up the ghost, though every time he is shot down, he comes up with a new reason for why Hero should go outside to fight Rauhu. These range from there's nothing to lose to I'll help you pick up chicks. And what tops this scene is that Harry blames Hero for his death from beyond the grave if you refuse. Choosing to refuse also doesn't punish you as you are brought right back to the start of the refusal scene. I know other games have had sequences like this, but they always treat it like an actual game over. Best example I can think of is refusing at the start of Super Paper Mario. The player hasn't had a chance to save yet, so picking the no option is a punishment that forces them to rewatch all the opening cinematics and story beats. Here in Battle Revolution, it knows that you want to select the weird zany options and never messes with the player when they choose said choices. It helps that the strange options are always given to the player during any dialogue section, including the tutorials. One specific option is when the player is trying to impress Ernest, they can get Hero to say that he's a good cook, leading to Ernest saying that whenever the sinister spatula and his big seal bandits attack, he will call Hero for help. It's odd, off the wall, bizarre, eccentric, and I love it. How about opting to run away from Eliza during the first fight with her? There are too many hilarious moments in the story for me to list, but I'll cover a few more of my favorite ones. Perhaps the most well-known one is Lee leaving Harry out to dry when he needs to go to the restroom. The player doesn't have to go with Harry to the restroom during the final section of the game as none of the fights there award parts. A new arena is given to the player, but that's the only tangible thing they get from joining Harry in the bathroom. What you get for not accompanying Harry is him giving out about how he got jumped. However, this is a case where I like both scenes as if you do go to the bathroom, Harry complains about having to fight people who haven't washed their hands. And that fact is brought up and made forefront as when Harry and Hero fight the second twosome in the stalls, one of the Z Syndicate members takes pleasure in the fact that Harry and Hero have to fight him in his dirty hands. It's like all I want to say to this no-name goon is, Okay, Mr. Strangler. This is all the stuff that happens in the main story, not counting all the NPC stories or interactions that are just as insane. You can find out that the robots in the gym have been programmed to feel emotions, leading to one of the most adorable side stories in the game. There's a kid that always trains at the gym as he wants to become the best commander to ever live. His father, a researcher, doesn't have a lot of time to spend with him, though he still supports his son's dream. Over the course of his training, the robot the kid always spars with starts wishing for the same thing, wanting to see the kids succeed. This sequence is never brought up to the player. You have to actively talk to the NPCs to find this out. There are a lot of hidden gems like this, such as finding out that Ernest canceled the main trio's gym memberships because he couldn't afford them. One of the best NPCs in the game is Lucy, fully because of how she either doesn't understand anything that Hero says in regards to his job or robos, or when she goes on a random tangent. I will never forget the peanut sneezing competition because of how ludicrous that idea is. 
was. Moving away from the story, Battle Revolution is probably the best arena fighter that I've ever played, and I've played a lot. There's the Naruto games, the Kill a Kill game, Gundam vs. Gotcha Force, and a few others, but this one beats them all out. How? Strategy is an actual thing, and the controls aren't garbage. Sure, you can win most fights in Robo by using the gun, hell, the shotgun is the prime example of that, it's the slayer of NPCs, but when fighting with someone with a working brain, or in my case, remain a mutated brainstem as I need something to eat and a person doesn't need a full brain to still function, having a Robo's part synergize is the way to go. Figuring out what parts work together is the core of Battle Revolution, as each weapon causes a Robo to be launched into a direction. With the amount of parts that are in the game, there are a lot of combos. Going down some individual parts, my favorite Robo series are the Strike Vanishers for their naming convention, their designs, and their gimmick stealth dashes, or in better terms, iframes on dashes. Sure, they are slower on the ground, but they are equal to the shining fighters in terms of stats. There's a reason why you see a lot of javelin in my footage. Javelin has one of the better melee attacks in the game as well, being a nigh instantaneous attack with no iframes that is spammable on an overloaded robo. To guns, I love the shotgun, but it pales in comparison to the more out there weapons. The hornet gun comes to mind. It fires fucking hornets. There's also also the bubble gun. If we are talking serious firepower, the worm gun is my favorite weapon overall. It's a modified dragon gun that fires multiple dragons on the ground or an extremely fast one in the air. The worm gun always brings back memories to me as when I was a kid and saw the opening movie with Rackison using it, it blew my damn mind. I wanted it and the robo as soon as I played the game. Little did I know what I had to do to get them. Grand Battle, or for its file name, fucking Grand Battle. There is no beating around the bush here, Grand Battle is a soporific slog. Whenever I go back to Custom Robo, I only play a new journey because of how much I hate Grand Battle. I've already explained what you do in the mode, but that is all you do in Grand Battle. There's no overtly witty dialogue, no change in the pacing, nothing. Do these tournaments and get out. Even though most tournaments force the player to change up their parts with the limited rule, every fight devolves into figuring out how to kill each opponent in a short amount of time while taking little damage. Now you know why I favor the shotgun, magnum, or stun gun. It is solely because of this game mode. The full extent of Battle Revolution's gameplay can't carry the entirety of Grand Battle, as that's when the major flaws, fights can be one-sided due to weapon balance, experimentation, means a hill of beans to a good gunner combo, there is a huge disparity between the Strike Vanisher class and all the other ones, in the game make themselves known. Grand Battle is mindless busy work, and to add insult to injury, it's how you unlock most of the parts in the game. That cool worm gun unlocked in Grand Battle. Rauhu? Grand Battle. Ray Legend or Chicken Heart? fucking grand battle. What doesn't help is that the RNG or enemy AI can sometimes decide to be annoying to an aggravating degree. Both in a new journey in grand battle, 2v2s are the bane of my existence because of how the AI can work. Sometimes you get a standard battle, other times the player AI is huffing paint while you're getting reamed in the corner. Once both enemy AIs are targeting you, fun becomes fuck as you're going to be yelling that when you're being tag teamed like you found yourself on a greasy casting couch for tag team. It says a lot that the only only handicap match in the player's favor is the hardest fight in a new journey. Besides these gameplay specific issues, a new journey's pacing can be utter wank at times. Why yes, let's follow up a tournament with another tournament, that's exactly what I asked for. And don't get me started on the funhouse. Why does the group split up? Why do none of the hiding Z members attack Harry, Marcia, or Sergei? Why must all these fights award the player with parts, forcing them to search around the funhouse just to make sure they don't miss anything? There are also only two maps for the funhouse, Panic Walls Red red, scramble walls, and scramble walls blue panic walls. They are the exact same map just with the wall tiles moving differently. The arena gimmick is also boring compared to a lot of the other ones. Lastly, the tutorials in the game are extremely hand-holdy, but not in the good way. Though Battle Revolution does have issues, particularly with its pacing, and the gameplay itself does run out of steam come Grand Battle, it's still a game I go back to every so often. I love the thought put into the gimmick of the game, and it shines completely in multiplayer. With Battle Revolution stuck to the GameCube and Nintendo doing nothing to port those games to any modern console, boot it up in Dolphin and add in Netplay for some online multiplayer fun. <coughs>
Seriously though, Grand Battle is such a slog and I do recommend that if you want to play Custom Robo as a multiplayer game, use a completed save file to skip it because damn it's so boring. Not as bad as the pacing though, but the concept and gameplay when it's broken up, save it for me. A few things I wanted to bring up here is that there is a cool bit of detail on the pods as when one is released, a bit of it will be highlighted in a color to show which player it's targeting. I only noticed this during my grand battle session after I had finished scripting the presentation. Likewise, the Don side story is funny as he leaves out food for customers even though his shop has been closed down. A part I didn't find time to go into is that the original custom robo has been translated in English, both available as a ROM and physical card. Reminds me a bit of Mega Man and Bass. <laughs> Reminds me a bit of Mega Man and Base, which got a reproduction cart for the SNES. Probably the funniest part about this, though, is that I said no videos in July at the end of Village, but turns out I write out short scripts quickly as I finished this one before June was even up. Call me Stephen King, just with less coke. More of a Pepsi man myself. This showing of Custom Robo Battle Revolution is over, but stay tuned for our next feature, involving scissors, awkward swimming controls, and the birth of a genre.